got a joke for you today. So once there was an American who went on holiday down under in Australia and so it happened that the poor guy had a heart attack. Shame. Then when he woke up in hospital and he eventually came around and he asked the nurse, Did you bring me here to die? And the nurse replied, No mate, brought you here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, today we're talking about acute coronary syndrome. I encourage you to smash that like, share and subscribe buttons. This is an outline of our talk. We're going to be addressing a clinical question and then taking a closer look at the phenomenon of acute coronary syndrome and breaking it down, the key points, headline in terms of what you need to know first up. Then we're going to go into an introduction, then we're going to dissect ACS in terms of etiologies, how patients present, look at a plausible differential diagnosis diagnostic evaluation in the way of investigations, treatment and management, prognosis and complications, and of course, we're going to end with the Bible. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you and your folks are well. Let's get stuck in early. All right, so today we are asking a clinical question. All of the following medications used in the acute management of ST elevation myocardial infarction are appropriately matched to the mechanism of effect, except one. Which one? Is it aspirin, reduces thromboxin A2? Is it abkiximab, which inhibits the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor? Is it beta adrenergic antagonists, which are beta blockers, which reduce myocardial oxygen consumption? Is it clopidogrel, which inhibits the platelet ADP receptor, adenosine diphosphate receptor? Or is it nitroglycerin, which reduces cardiac afterload? Mm -hmm. Guys, here are the headline points for ACS. Acute coronary syndrome. All of them result from acute obstruction of a coronary artery. Now, consequences by and large depend on the degree and the location of the obstruction and range from unstable, sorry, I said instable, they're unstable angina, to non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarct, more affectionately termed NSTEMI, to ST elevation myocardial infarct, termed STEMI, and then lastly, sudden cardiac death. Now, symptoms are similar in each of these symptoms, of course, excepting cardiac death, and include chest discomfort with or without dyspnea, nausea, and diaphoresis, which are your dysautonomic features, right? Diagnosis is largely by ECG, and then we look for the presence or absence of specific serological markers. Treatment is with antiplatelet drugs, anticoagulants, nitrates, beta blockers, and for STEMI, emergency reperfusion is the name of the game via either fibrinolytic drugs, percutaneous coronary intervention, or occasionally coronary artery bypass graft in the way of cabbage. I right, call it cabbage, C-A-P-G. Alrighty, guys, here's the introduction. Myocardial infarct is the term used to describe myocardial cell death that occurs as a result of a sustained imbalance between myocardial oxygen demand and supply. Between demand and supply, there's a mismatch. Now, acute coronary syndrome is the term used to describe the underlying pathophysiology of the continuum of clinical presentations known as STEMI and STEMI and unstable angina. Now, reperfusion with fibrinolytic therapy or mechanical revascularization, which is what we also term percutaneous coronary intervention or angioplasty, has been demonstrated to improve mortality in ST elevation MIs. The mortality benefit is greater the earlier the treatment is initiated after symptom onset, giving us the maximum time is muscle. Just like when we're treating acute um, a thrombotic or ischemic CVA, time is brain. Alrighty, let's look at etiology, epidemiology, and risk factors. So, ST elevation MI occurs as a result of abrupt rupture of a lipid-laden atherosclerotic plaque. We're going to have a look at some diagrams coming up. This rupture exposes a very highly thrombogenic surface within the arterial wall that initiates platelet activation and a coagulation cascade, resulting in the formation of an occlusive cascade of red blood cells, fibrin, and platelets. Abrupt, complete occlusion of the coronary vessel and cessation of flow ensues, resulting in an unfortunately myocardial injury, which is demonstrated as ST elevation on the ECG, and infarction or cell death, which is demonstrated as a beloved Q waves on the ECG if myocardial damage is indeed extensive. In contrast, the non-ST elevation myocardial infarct and STEMI is due to the same underlying pathology, but plaque rupture leads to critical but non-total, that's it, in STEMI it's critical but non-total reduction of coronary blood flow. Profound ischemia results and may result in infarction, characterized by a positive uh, creatinine kinase isoenzyme MB uh, or troponin leak. 
unstable angina has defined as anginal symptoms that are of new onset within the last two months by definition, which increases in frequency or duration and have a decreasing threshold of onset or occur at rest. Okay. Now, 95% of cases of ACS can be attributed to coronary atherosclerosis. Risk factors, I'm sure all of us are familiar with these, include advanced age, male sex, prior history of myocardial infarct, family history of myocardial infarct in first-degree relatives, tobacco use, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, and concomitant atherosclerotic disease elsewhere, like if you've got peripheral vascular disease, carotid vessel disease, if you've got a stroke. Now, less frequent causes... <laughs> Uh, include thrombus formation in the absence of atherosclerotic disease, vasospasm, especially Prince metals in China, cocaine use, coronary dissection, and thromboembolism. Okay, this is a beautiful uh, algorithm taken from the ESC, European Society of Cardiology Guidelines, 2020 for the management of ACS in patients who are presenting without persistent ST elevation. So first up, guys, your clinical settings. So take a good history, ascertain the timing of the chest pain, and of course, the dysautonomic features. Does it radiate anywhere? What's the aggravating? What's the relieving factors? Okay. And this severity of the clinical presentation can range from just retrosternal chest discomfort right through to radiation, through to involvement of the entire um, precordium, uh, through to a patient who is in uh, cardiogenic shock. Okay. Then looking at the ECG, it progresses through a continuum, right? So we've got a normal ECG, or you've got ST depression, as we can see here, which indicates, you know, just a mild uh, uh, infarct. Then we've got uh, ST depression, which is more significant, which heralds the NSTEMI, right, probably. And here is marked ST elevation. Then we look at the troponin. So they use a very high sensitivity troponin. And they look at the value at zero hours and then the change within one, two, or three hours. We don't have the high sensitivity troponin available locally. So we advise repeating your tropes every six to eight hours, all right? So this, obviously, in the milder myocardial infarct, there's going to be no troponin leak because there's hardly any myocardial damage. And so your troponins are negative both initially and thereafter. And as the severity of the infarct, you know, uh, increases, uh, or, or as we have a more severe infarct, we'll have more troponin leak, right? Then, of course, our triage decision is we can rule out MI, we can observe and rule in a MI, and then based on the diagnosis, it can be non-cardiac chest pain versus unstable angina versus other cardiac issue versus NSTEMI versus STEMI, right? Okay, so the unstable angina will have the history of chest pain, which is becoming progressively worse or more frequent, but you won't have a cardiac troponin leak and you won't have ECG changes. Versus NSTEMI, in which you have the history, you have ST depression and you will have a troponin leak. Versus STEMI, well, you, will you will have ST elevation with marked troponin leak. We're okay, looking at the pathophysiology here. This is taken from Harrison's, and we just are comparing uh, the characteristics of human atheromata complicated by thrombosis and causing acute coronary syndrome. So the column on the left highlights some of the characteristics demonstrated by analyses of human coronary arterial lesions that have undergone thrombosis by two diverse mechanisms, right? So we have the eruption plaque, which is probably underlying pathology of a STEMI, right? Remember, the different layers is the tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica adventitia, right? And so what we have here is uh, atheroma, right? And we have erosion of the atheroma, which is plaque, erosion of the fibrous cap, which is highly thrombogenic. So we have our platelets coming in there, occluding the lumen completely in the ST elevation MI, right? So eruption plaque consists of a thin fibrous cap, collagen poor fibrous cap, a large lipid core, many macrophages, and a fibrin-rich thrombus. Remember, the underlying pathology of atherosclerosis is foam cells, macrophages become full of foam cells, and the small muscle cells also migrate to the site. And then we have the formation of the fibrous cap, erosion of the fibrous cap, highly thrombogenic, and we have the formation of a clot, which occludes the lumen, right? And eroded plaque is slightly different here. These are proteoglycan and glycos aminoglycan-rich. There's little or no lipid core, neutrophils come in, many spoon muscle cells, and platelet-rich thrombus, right? Note how there's hardly any uh, platelets here. Okay, let's look at the TIMI risk score for an NSTEMI. Uh, well, the NSTEMI, the term is now revised to NST elevation acute coronary syndrome, but NSTEMI is synonymous with this. Risk markers looking at an age above 65. If you have known coronary artery disease with more than 50% stenosis, SC deviation of greater than 0.5 millimeters on presenting ECG, raised cardiac markers, more greater than or equal to two original episodes in the prior 24 hours, prior angina, and more than three coronary artery disease uh, risk factors. And if you look at the number of risk markers, this uh, you know, correlates with a higher incidence of adverse cardiac uh, event percentage. With six to seven of these risk markers, Correlating with up to a 41% incidence of adverse cardiac events. Okay, 
Guys, how do patients with acute coronary syndrome present? I'm glad you asked. Chest discomfort is often described as crushing or pressure, like an elephant is sitting on my chest. It is the most common symptom, okay? And that should alert us to the possibility that indeed this is an acute coronary syndrome. Usually it's dull, left-sided, and substernal. It may radiate through to the arms, the neck, the jaw, the shoulders, and the back. May be asymptomatic, especially in those who are diabetic because of neuropathy, right? Um, sensory and autonomic neuropathy, females and the elderly patients. Associated symptoms include dyspnea, right? Nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis. You also get these are kind of like dysautonomic features. Ventricular tachycardia or sudden death due to ventricular fibrillation may be the first manifestation of AST elevation MI or other ACS, emphasizing the need for continuous ECG monitoring in suspected patients. Elevated jugular venous pressure, hypotension, and clear lungs all are harbingers for a right ventricular infarct. Let's say it again. Elevated jugular venous pressure, hypotension, clear lungs suggest that this could be a right ventricular infarct. This is a beautiful algorithm showing us the approach to acute chest pain taken from McLeod's clinical diagnosis. So obviously you're going to triage your patient first, attend to the circulation, airway, breathing, do an ECG. So now the ECG suggests ST elevation MI. Yes, likely it's a STEMI and you are to consider urgent referral to a PCI-capable hospital or uh, fibrinolysis, right? If it's not a STEMI and if they're not within the window for thrombolysis, uh, but if there are major ischemic ECG changes, it's likely an ACS like an NSTEMI. If no, then suspect that it, could this be an aortic dissection, especially in the setting of a hypertensive emergency? Could this be a pulmonary embolus, especially with a patient who is dyspneic and has changes indicative of right ventricular strain on the ECG? Could this be esophageal rupture? You do urgent imaging, and then you rule in or out your suspected diagnoses, right? If there's more than one diagnostic feature of pericarditis, do an echo and consider pericardi pericarditis, and especially if the patient has signs of tamponade uh, or, or a significant pericardial effusion that is amenable to pericardial synthesis, you want to intervene. If no, ask yourself, is there a clear history of pleuritic chest pain? Then you approach it as such. If no, is there a history still consistent with ACS? If yes, do a full clinical assessment, repeat your ECG, repeat your cardiac biomarkers at six to eight hourly intervals, do your chest X, say full blood count, urea, electric, if the history is not consistent with ACS, consider that this could be a gastrointestinal, muscular lethal, respiratory, mediastinal, or psychological cause. If there's any ischemic ECG changes or an increase in troponin, likely acute coronary syndrome, right? Uh, but if other alternatives um, should be considered, right? But if no, is there still a high clinical probability of ACS? It's likely an ACS and assess further. If no, if there's a low clinical probability of ACS, uh, so you know you want to consider alternatives, right? Alrighty. So Harrison's much more looking at the critical determinants of myocardial um, infarction injury. All right. So here we have the overlapping of vulnerable plaque and thrombogenic blood are critical determinants for myocardial infarction occurrence and extension. In addition, myocardial vulnerability, which is largely due to coronary microvascular dysfunction, contributes to extension and severity of the ischemic injury. In the most severe form, known as no reflow, structural and functional impairments sustain vascular obstruction. Endothelial dysfunction triggers leukocyte and platelet activation and interaction, whereas thrombotic debris may worsen the obstruction. Furthermore, cardiomyocyte swelling, interstitial edema, and tissue inflammation promote extravascular compression. So here we have, you know, myocardium which is vulnerable, right, on the basis of inflammation, ischemia, duration and extent, and individual susceptibility. And if you look histologically speaking at that myocardium, we're going to find cardiomyocyte swelling, interstitial edema, thrombus, debris, endothelial dysfunction, leukocyte and platelet activation and interaction. And within the actual coronary, within the actual coronary vessel, uh, we're going to find a vulnerable plaque on the basis of inflammation, extension, severity and location, and thrombogenic blood on the basis of those factors. Okay, now there's different kinds of myocardial infarct we have. So this diagram just delineates the difference between myocardial infarct type 1 and type 2. So type 1 MIs are caused by arterothrombotic coronary artery disease and usually precipitated by atherosclerotic plaque disruption, either by rupture or erosion. The relative burden of atherosclerosis and thrombosis in the culprit lesion varies significantly. Okay, so there we see type 1 MI. There's plaque rupture or erosion with an occlusive thrombus, complete occlusion of that coronary vessel. And here we have plaque rupture or erosion with a non-occlusive thrombus. Right, but ultimately you're going to have damaged myocardium, right? Versus type 2 myocardial infarct, in which the pathophysiological mechanism leading to ischemic my myocardial injury and the context of a mismatch 
between oxygen supply and demand. So there's here there's a supply demand mismatch, right? Uh, here we can see <coughs> other sclerosis and oxygen supply demand mismatch, very narrowed lumen. Here we have vasospasm or coronary microvascular dysfunction. Here we have non-atherosclerotic coronary dissection, not very common. Here we have oxygen supply demand mismatch alone. And usually it happens in the setting of, you know, tachycardia uh, induced conditions like, uh, you know, thyroid storm or severe anemia. Okay, guys, what is the differential diagnosis for an acute coronary syndrome? So in the heart, maybe it's myocardial ischemia, which is ACS, right? Or it could be pericarditis, pericardial effusion, aortic dissection, congestive heart failure. Myocarditis with pericarditis may present with ST elevation and uh, troponin leak. Pulmonary considerations as well, don't forget, right? Chest pain could be due to pneumothorax, pulmonary embolus, like we mentioned, bronchitis, pneumonia, pleurisy, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. From the gastrointestinal perspective, it could be esophagitis, esophageal spasm, esophageal perf, gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, duodenitis, cholecystitis, and pancreatitis. Also consider muscle lethal possibilities in the way of rib fracture, costochondritis, herpes zoster, muscle strain or contusion, anxiety. So this could be psychogenic chest pain, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. Guys, when working up chest pain, it's intuitive for us to evaluate initially with a proper history and physical, then do an ECG, chest X-ray, and do your cardiac enzymes, okay? ECG may reveal a couple of possibilities. We're going to go through these. ST segment elevation, which refers to elevation in at least two contiguous leads suspicious for acute myocardial injury, right? And we know that there's different territories in which the infarct may occur, the inferior territory, the anterior lateral territory, and the, you know, the, the, we have, could have right ventricular infarct and so forth. T-wave changes in the way of T-wave uh, inversion. You can have ST depression, um, bundle branch block, or Q-waves, okay? The distribution of the ST segment elevation corresponds to the region of myocardial injury. Very important. Okay, I just want to draw special attention to this, right? So, leads 2, 3, and AVF indicate inferior injury, right? 1 and AVL indicate lateral or what we call far lateral injury. V1 to V3 correspond to anteroceptral injury. V3 to V5 to anterior injury and V4 to V6, anterior lateral injury, okay? Okay, so here we're looking at evolution of ST elevation MI. So before infarct, this is basically the picture we see, right? Normal QRS complex, uh, normal P and T waves. In a hyperacute ST elevation, we see marked ST elevation, and this usually happens within minutes to hours. If you're looking at the time period between an hour to about a day, we have marked ST elevation, but note what happens, T wave inversion, right? A week later, what we have is Q waves forming together with the coronary T wave, the inverted uh, T wave, and months later, we see the Q wave just persists, but the, uh, you might have some degree of ST elevation, but that's the situation, right? Okay, guys, let's now speak to a couple of ECGs. What's happening here, guys? What can you spot? Uh, it's nice for you to pause the video now, have a look, and uh, then we look at the answer. Yeah, the main abnormality is here, as we can see. Let me get my pen in there. Is ST elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF. This is a beautiful inferior MI. We also have ST depression with the inverted, inverted T wave in lead 1, in AVL, and lead V2. These are the so-called reciprocal changes, all right? Uh, so this is an acute inferior STEMI. You want to do a, um, an ECG with a V4R, otherwise you might miss a right ventricular infarct, okay? All right, pause and let's have a look. What are the main abnormalities here? The two most important abnormal findings we have in this ECG are, so we have ST elevation in the anterior kind of territory, isn't it? In the anterior territory, right? I'm oh, sorry. So... Oh dear. Okay. Anterior territory, which is V1, V2, and V3. Pathological Q waves in V1 and V2. Look how deep these Q waves are. So this is an acute anteroceptal STEMI. All right. We also see some ST elevation in V4 as well. And the main abnormality is here, guys. So let's just get my pen in there. So we have pathological Q waves in these um, uh, V1, V2, and V3. We have T-wave inversion in the, you know, kind of far lateral territory, V5, V6, and V4. This indicates an old anterior myocardial infarct, all right? And here, list of abnormalities. Well, if you look closely, what we can see is the pathological Q-wave in the inferior territory, 2, 
3 and AVF. So this just speaks to an old inferior MI. All right. And here, list the abnormalities. Okay, so here we can definitely see some stuff that's happening. We've got a wide QRS. This QRS is above 0 0.12 seconds or three small blocks. This indicates a bundle branch block, right? If you look at the configuration of this, it's kind of like a WM, a William configuration, like a W in V1 and a M configuration in V6. This is a left bundle branch block pattern, okay? Now, guys, we've got to beware as well. Right, if you have evidence of an inferior myocardial infarct, and evidence of an inferior myocardial infarct, right, 2, 3 AVF, have ST elevation, you want to check your right-sided leads, a V4R, to assess for the possibility of a right ventricular infarct, right, because both are probably taken by the right coronary artery, okay, um, which occurs in about 50% of patients with an inferior MI. And, of course, clinically, you may see the, 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 the telltale signs clinically would be a raised jugular venous pressure, a customer sign, right, which is... Right, when you breathe in, the JVP should go down, but here you have a paradoxical increase in the JVP on breathing in, right? And clear lungs clinically. All that are harbingers for a right ventricular infarct, right? ST elevation in V4R is diagnostic and prognostic. Hypotension should be treated with fluid bolus to ensure a good preload. Do not give vasodilating drugs. Stay away from your nitrate, stay away from your morphine. For the posterior infarct, guys, if you have ST depression in V1 to V2 and a regular ECG, it should automatically trigger you to request for the posterior leads, V7 through V9, to check for a posterior MI. Posterior infarct may be associated with inferior infarcts 90% of the time and lateral infarcts 10% of the time as the posterior descending artery may be supplied by the right or left uh, circumflex coronary. We'll be looking at the different vessels and territories shortly, right? Part of the evaluation, guys, is the chest x-ray to assess for a wide mediastinum, and that would surely indicate that the, pos the possibility of a aortic dissection. You also want to check for an infiltrate or consolidation, which speaks to pneumonia, or, of course, a pneumothorax as a differential for the chest pain. Cardiac enzymes, so we've got the creatinine kinase with the isoenzyme MB, muscle brain form, CKMB, and troponin are often diagnostic for infarction. However, they may not be elevated on the initial presentation. They, they are definitely elevated in an ST elevation MI and a non-ST elevation MI. By definition, they are not elevated in unstable angina. That's the main differentiating factor between unstable angina and your uh, STEMI, non-STEMI. Trope I and CKMB rise to detectable levels within three to six hours. But the thing here is that trope I can remain elevated for a long time, up to seven days. So if the patient has a V infarct, it would not declare on the trope I. And hence, that is the benefit of doing a CKMB. Because that goes up and down within three days. And if the patient has a reinfarct within the week, it will declare on the CKMB, but not on the trope I. If the diagnosis is uncertain, echocardiography can be used to assess for our beloved wall motion abnormalities, consistent with the distribution of the coronary artery, which is characteristic of acute myocardial injury. Echo can also evaluate for possible complications of myocardial infarct, example, ventricular rupture, ventricular aneurysm, ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation, and so forth, right? So here is a beautiful um, uh, diagram, once more. We're looking here at the zone of necrosing myocardium. Right? So this is the zone of necrosing myocardium, the so-called hibernating myocardium. All right? And here we're looking at our, our enzymes. Right? So the CKMB, we said, it rises. So on the x-axis, we have days after onset of MI. And on the y-axis, multiples of the AMI uh, qubit limit. So we see CKMB rises. It, it peaks at about a day. And it's down by about two to three days, right? However, your troponin rises up. It should be maximum within a day or so, but it remains elevated for up to seven days. And hence the value of doing your CKMB to detect reinfarction within the acute phase, right? Okay, guys, let's talk about treatment and management. Lots to talk about here. So initial interventions in patients suspected of having angina or myocardial infarct includes number one, bed rest, number two, supplemental oxygen. You want to maintain your stats around 96%. Then you want to give them dual antiplatelets. That is the big buzzword, dual antiplatelets. So aspirin, at least 160 milligrams chewable initially. Some people even give up to 600 milligrams initially. Then at least 81 milligrams per day. And clopidogrel, which is Plavix, 300 milligrams stat followed by 75 milligrams daily thereafter. So it's aspirin and Plavix. And you're going to continue your Plavix for at least a year post-intervention, right? Uh, nitroglycerin, if the systolic blood pressure is above 100 mls mercury, because remember, nitrates are going to cause vasodilation and drop your blood pressure. If the patient's systolic is less than 100, not a good idea to give nitrates. 
right? And ideally, you can repeat 0.4 milligram uh, nitroglycerin sublingual, uh, which is TNT, every five minutes for up to three doses, and begin IV administration if the pain persists and the patient is normal tensive, okay? Revascularization is the definitive therapy for acute STEMI. Revascularization is the name of the game. Primary angioplasty is preferred if you have a PCI-capable hospital, which you can reach quickly. Otherwise, fibrinolysis or thrombolysis is indicated if timely angioplasty is not available and the patient does not have contraindications already. Now, in terms of thrombolysis, there's a couple of agents we can use. We can use streptokinase, we can use alsoplase, we can use metoplase. Right, so locally, streptokinase is 1.5 million units which you put into, uh, I think it's a 500 mil uh, bag of normal cell and run it over an hour, but always ensure you have constant ECG monitoring because these patients can develop arrhythmias, can become uh, allergic, so you may have hypersensitivity reactions, so be alert for that. The also place comes in 100 milligram amp, so you want to administer 15 milligrams acutely over about 15 minutes, then you want to give uh, I think it is 50 milligrams over the next hour, right? And then the balance is 35 milligrams over the next two hours, okay? Metalase is just a stat dose, stat IV push, um, and it's weight-based, okay? Basal blockers are used to decrease myocardial workload and oxygen demand. Calcium channel blockers, the likes of rapamoldatiazin, which are the non dihydropyridine flavor, may be used in place of beta blockers if beta blockers are contraindicated. Example, a patient who has acute wheezing due to asthma, and of course, if the ejection fraction is normal. Now, unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin, more affectionately termed inoxaparin sodium, are used to inhibit thrombin. But so you remember, you've got to be sure that you're not dealing with an aortic dissection and a GI bleed before you bring heparin on board, right? Uh, and then we spoke about clopidogrel, which is Plavix, and the glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors may be used in conjunction with the thrombin inhibitor to prevent platelet aggregation and thrombus formation. Right? So this is just a checklist approach uh, taken from Approach to Internal Medicine. Thank you so much, guys. So we're dealing with stable angina, unstable angina, and STEMI and STEMI. All of them get aspirin. All of them get nitrates. Morphine, you may want to consider for stable angina, but more for unstable angina and STEMI. STEMI, beta blockers for all of them, ACE inhibitors or ARBs for all of them. Uh, statins for all of them, right? And stat dose, statin is about 80 milligrams stat, and then you can go about 20 milligrams uh, a two of a statin, for instance, daily thereafter. Heparin, you don't want to give for stable angina, but you give it for unstable angina and STEMI. STEMI, you can consider your P2 well 12 inhibitors for these two categories as well. Fibrinolytics or PCI only for STEMI, right? Cardiology counsel can be as outpatient for stable angina. You want to admit a patient with an end STEMI or a STEMI uh, or even unstable angina in two. Uh, high care or ICU. Remember that if you are presenting to a PCI capable hospital, that's percutaneous coronary intervention, then primary PCI should be performed within 90 minutes from time of first medical contact. Thank you so much. 90 minute door to proceed your time. If the initial presentation is to a non-PCI capable hospital, then you want to arrange urgent transfer to a PCI capable hospital if primary PCI can be performed within 120 minutes, which is logistically quite difficult in our setting. So ideally, if that cannot be provided, we give fibrinolytic with a door to needle time of 30 minutes. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, just to mention here that cardiac troponins have a wider differential. It doesn't always indicate myocardial injury in the setting of a STEMI or an NSTEMI, right? It could be due to acute MI, yes. It could be myocardial injury related to the acute myocardial ischemia because of oxygen supply, uh, you know, demand imbalance, which is type 2 MI, which can be due to a variety of causes, reduced myocardial perfusion, or increased myocardial oxygen demand, especially the setting of sustained tachyarrhythmia and sustained hypertension. Other causes can be other cardiac conditions, heart failure, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, takotsubo, the broken heart syndrome, recent coronary revasque, okay, cardiac procedure, catheter ablation, defibrillation, or systemic conditions, especially CKD, especially stroke. These are differentials for a raised troponin leak. Sepsis, pulmonary embolus, infiltrative diseases, right, chemotherapeutic agents, critical illness, strenuous exercise. The point there is that troponin leak does not always equal acute coronary syndrome. Further medical therapy includes statins, which have been shown to stabilize the atherosclerotic plaques, and there are a variety of pleiotropic effects of statins, so much so that some people say, hey, we should put statins in the drinking water in the tap. <laughs> ACE inhibitors after resolution of the acute event, right? So not acutely, bring your ACE in after resolution of the acute event to prevent cardiac remodeling, you know those deals right there. Cardiac rehabilitation, dietary and exercise counseling and smoking cessation should be recommended. 
Okay, guys, I just want to spend some time talking about the 2020 ESD guidelines for management of ACS in patients presenting without ST sigma elevation. So basically, we're speaking to unstable angina and non-STEMI here, right? So the new key recommendations is as an alternative to the zero one hour algorithm is recommended to use the zero to two hour algorithm with blood sampling at zero to two hours. But remember, they use a high sensitivity cardiac troponin, which we don't have locally available. For diagnostic purposes, it is not recommended to routinely measure additional biomarkers such as CK, CKMB, copeptin, Right? We don't even have those available. So risk stratification, measuring B naturally peptide or NT pro BNP plasma concentration should be considered to gain prognostication information, but these assays are quite expensive, right? Antithrombotic treatment, prasugrel, should be considered in preference to tachycrylor for NSTEMI. Patients will proceed to PCI. In terms of antithrombotic treatment, the new recommendations is that it is not recommended to administer routine pretreatment with the P2Y12 receptor inhibitor in patients in whom the coronary, uh, coronary anatomy is not known and early invasive management is planned. In patients with NSTEMI who cannot undergo an early invasive strategy, pretreatment with a P2Y12 inhibitor may be considered depending on bleeding risk. De-escalation of the P2Y12 inhibitor treatment example with a switch from presugrel to, or trichacolor to clopidog may be considered as an alternative to the dual antiplatelet therapy, especially for ACS patients deemed unsuitable for potent platent inhibition. Okay, further uh, recommendations in patients with atrial fibrillation with a chat vas score of above 1 in men and a greater than or equal to 2 in women after a short period of, uh, you know, triple antiplatelet therapy, which is basically warfarin plus aspirin, plus Plavix, or you can use your P2Y12 inhibitors. Right? Dual antibiotic therapy is recommended as a default strategy using a NOAC, right? Or the recommended dose for stroke prevention and single oral antibiotic agent, preferably clopidogrel. Discontinuation of antiplatelet treatment in patients treated with oral anticoagulants is recommended after 12 months. Dual antiplatelets with um, oral anticoagulant and either tachycular or presugrel may be considered as an alternative to triple antiplatelet therapy with the oral anticoagulant aspirin and clopidog in patients with a moderate or high risk of stent thrombosis, irrespective of the type of stent used. Invasive treatment. An early invasive strategy within 24 hours is recommended in patients with any of the following high-risk criteria. Diagnosis of NSTEMI number one. Number two, dynamic or presumably new contiguous STT wave segment changes suggesting ongoing ischemia. Number three, transient ST segment elevation. Number four, a grace risk score of over 140. A selective invasive strategy after appropriate ischemia testing or detection of obstructive coronary artery disease uh, is recommended in patients considered at low risk. Okay, and also... Um, delayed as opposed to immediate angiography should be considered in hemodynamically stable patients without ST sigma elevation successfully resuscitated and out of hospital cardiac arrest. Complete revask should be considered in cases of NSTEMI patients without cardiogenic shock and with multi-vessel coronary artery disease. Complete revask during index PCI may be considered in NSTEMI patients with multi-vessel disease. Alrighty. Now, just a quick look at the new recommendations as per the 2017 guidelines from the ESC. Right, regarding a STEMI. So regarding ECG monitoring, 12-lead ECG recording and interpretation is indicated as soon as possible at the point of first medical contact with a maximum target daily uh, delay sorry, of 10 minutes. Right? So no more than 10 minutes from the patient the time the patient comes in to your ECG, pronto. ECG monitoring with defibrillator capacity is indicated as soon as possible in all patients with suspected STEMI. Because remember, the STEMI patients may progress to an arrhythmia quickly, especially with reperfusion. The use of additional posterior chest wall leads V7TV9 in patients with high suspicion of posterior myocardial infarction because of circumflex occlusion. We spoke about this. The use of additional right precordial leads V3R and V4R in patients with inferior MI right should be considered to identify concomitant RV infarction. And we spoke about that. Blood sampling, routine blood sampling for serum markers is indicated as soon as possible in the acute phase, but should not delay reperfusion treatment, right? In the setting of bundle branch block, we're going to go through this Carbosa criteria just now. Uh, yeah. And uh, here is this Carbosa criteria. So uh, traditionally, you know, if a patient presents with a left bundle branch block and we're not sure whether it's new or old, you know, normally we say we can't interpret the ST segment in such situations. But now we have the modified Scarbosa criteria, right? And let me just get my pen in there to show us, right? So if we look at concordant ST elevation, where the QRS complex of the left bundle branch block and the ST elevation are going in the same direction as depicted here, that gives you five points, right? And 
However, if you look at the second diagram, if you've got SC deviation by greater than one millimeter in V1 to V3, that scores you three points. And if you've got discordant ST elevation, where the ST elevation and the QRS are going in kind of opposite directions, that scores you two points. So a composite score of greater than equal to three has a specificity of diagnosing acute myocardial infarct. So if a patient fulfills the Scarbosa criteria and they're within the 12 hour window for thrombolysis, you should thrombolyze. Alrighty, so here we're looking at the heart pathway for evaluation of acute chest pain. Let's just have a look at this. Patient comes with acute chest pain, do your ECG. If it's non ischemic but the patient has known coronary artery disease, if the answer is no, you do your heart score. Between 0 to 3, do your serial troponins. If it's less than 99th uh, percentile, early discharge. If the heart score is greater than 4, and uh, you know, then you're sitting above the 99th percentile, ideally you want to get a cardiology consult and admit the patient. But if the patient has known coronary artery disease, and has a troponin leak and is sitting below the 99th percentile in terms of your heart score, you observe or uh, consider admission. And ideally, those patients are suitable for stress testing or angiography, right? If you do STEMI, then ideally, you know, we spoke about STEMI. You can do a PCI or you can go for abnormalysis already. Okay, just to mention a couple of drugs we can use, okay? Recommendations for anti-ischemic drugs in the acute phase of NSTEMI. We spoke about nitrates, we spoke about beta blockers, right? Provided that the blood pressure is not too low. And not acutely, ideally after resolution somewhat. Calcium channel blockers, morphine we spoke about. And in terms of our antithrombotics, the oral antiplatelets um, that we have within our armamentarium is aspirin. And we spoke about the doses, clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor. IV antiplatelet therapy, you can have cangrelor to fibotide and tyrofoban. Parental anticoagulants is unfractionated heparin, then we've got inoxaparin sodium, which is clexane, bivalirudin, fondaparinex. And oral anticoagulant drugs, concomitant treatment after PCI, is your vitamin K antagonist, you've got apixaban, dabigatran, edoxaban, rivaroxaban, which is xeralto. Okay, guys, reperfusion therapy for a patient with a STEMI. Alrighty, so here, we're asking the question, STEMI patient who is a candidate for reperfusion, initially seen at a PCI-capable hospital, get that patient to their cath lab within 90 minutes. That is it. If your hospital is non-PCI-capable, which is most of the hospitals in our setting, then you want to get a door-in to door-out time of less than 30 minutes. Get the patient thrombolyzed as soon as possible. Right. Uh, if you can transfer to the PCI-capable hospital within 120 minutes, do it. But if you can't, give a fibrinolytic within 30 minutes. All right. And then thereafter, urgent transfer to a PCI-capable hospital or transfer for angio and revascularization, right? Here is a schema showing us the primary mechanisms of balloon angioplasty and stenting, all right? So in, in A, a balloon angioplasty catheter, our little green device here, is positioned into the stenosis and over a guide wire under fluoroscopic guidance. And what happens then is the balloon is then inflated, as we can see here, temporarily occluding the vessel. And thereafter, the lumen is enlarged primarily by stretching the vessel, often resulting in small dissections in the neo-intima. And lastly, we have D, where a stent is now mounted, like, like a, this, this, this knit meshwork kind of uh, structure is uh, uh, mounted. Um, so a stent mounted on a deflated balloon is passed into the lesion and against the vessel wall with balloon inflation. The balloon is deflated and removed, leaving the stent permanently against the wall, acting as a scaffold to hold the dissections against the wall and prevent vessel recoil. Beautiful. Okay, guys, just a quick uh, rehash of coronary anatomy, right? So we have, uh, let me get my pen in there. The right coronary artery here, right coronary, gives rise to the right marginal branch, the right posterior descending, and the right posterior lateral branches, right? So it gives rise to the right posterior descending artery, okay? And it gives rise to the obtuse. Uh, marginal branches. The left main coronary artery, as you know, gives rise to the left anterior descending, the big kingpin there. Then we've got the left circumflex artery, the ramus intermediate, and um, the obtuse marginal, right? Sometimes. Uh, the dominant artery is defined as the artery that supplies a posterior descending and at least one posterior lateral artery. That's the dominant artery. Here we're looking at pathobiology of acute effects of balloon angioplasty uh, with intimal dissection and vessel stretching. So A here is an example of neo-intimal hyperplasia, right, and restenosis showing re-narrowing of the vessel, right, and here there's re-narrowing, all right, and this is basically what we see under fluoroscopic guidance when we are doing the stenting procedure. So long-term results from one of the first patients to receive a serolimus eluting stent from um, 
and we can see here the the occluded segment and post um, intervention uh, or stint deployment this is what it looks like uh, at four months at 12 months at 24 months and at 48 months that was a successful serolimus drug eluting stent deployment guys we're winding down now prognosis and complications mortality in STEMI has decreased by 30 percent over the past decade half of the deaths occur within the first hour usually due to ventricular arrhythmias the higher the cardiac troponin the higher the one-year mortality so there's prognostication significance in your troponin level predictors of increased mortality include history of diabetes active congestive heart failure recurrent ischemia advanced age prolonged time to reperfusion resting left ventricular ejection fraction below 40 percent and the presence of sustained or non-sustained vtac Ominous complications include pupillary muscle rupture with acute mitral insufficiency, ventricular septal defect, myocardial wall rupture. Alrighty guys, so coming back to our clinical question, all of the following meds used in the acute management of STEMI are appropriately matched in the mechanism of effect with one exception and the exception is nitroglycerin. Right, all of the choices are appropriate therapy for patients with STEMI in certain scenarios, right? Um, although nitroglycerin is effective as an anti-anginal agent in the setting of STEMI, it enacts those, enacts those effects through decreasing payload and perhaps through some direct nitric oxide-induced coronary vasodilation. Nitroglycerin has minimal effect on systemic afterload, and that is the reason that was the exception in this clinical question. Okay, my friends, let's just talk about the Bible for a bit, my favorite portion of this talk. Isaiah 49.15 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. And this is the Lord's promise to us, that he will never leave nor forsake us. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 31 verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. My friends, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble or hardship or nakedness or danger or famine or persecution or sword, knowing all these things, God will never leave nor forsake you. Be encouraged. Here are my references. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this video, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. You can catch me on Facebook. Just search for internal medicine algorithms and mnemonics. I'm also on TikTok, and I'm also on Instagram as well. We're going to be talking about asthma and COPD in coming videos. God bless you. Thank you so much for your support, and have yourself a lovely day.